Welcome to uh, Boston Law College Law School and uh, to our program today, which is brought to you by the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy. As most of you know, the Rappaport Center is in the, its fifth year here at BC Law, and throughout the academic year, it convenes myriad thought leaders, legislators, scholars, and practitioners in wide-ranging public policy areas. The Rappaport Center, as part of our law school, broadens our horizons by raising uh, raising uh, issues and bringing to campus individuals who represent ideological differences and challenge us to consider multiple perspectives. As a law school, it's particularly important for all of us to be able to hear from and interact with people with whom we do not necessarily agree. So we're proud to have the Rappaport Center here to continue BC Law's long-standing tradition of fostering democratic dialogue. So this afternoon, I'm delighted to welcome United States Congressman and newly announced U.S. Senatorial candidate, Doug Collins from Georgia to Boston College Law School. The congressman has a long history of public service for which he credits his parents. His father was a state trooper in Georgia and his mother provided care for local senior citizens. With his parents as his guiding post, the congressman served as a Navy, Navy chaplain for two years and following the tragedies of 9-11, he joined the Air Force Reserve Command where he serves as a lieutenant colonel. In 2008, Congressman Collins was deployed to Iraq for a year of combat duty. His political career began as a state representative in Georgia, where he held office from 2007 to 2013, running unopposed in 2008 and 2010. During his first term, he graduated from John Marshall Law School, not an easy task to juggle being a state representative and a law student, as I'm sure many people here can attest. The congressman also holds a master's degree in divinity from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and an undergraduate degree in political science and criminal justice from the University of North Georgia. In 2013, the congressman was elected to the House of Representatives, where he now serves as the ranking member of the U.S. House Committee on the Judiciary, having been elected to that position by his colleagues. He's been married for more than 30 years to a fifth grade teacher, and the congressman and his wife have three children, a daughter and two sons. He describes himself as foremost a husband and father and an individual who lives a life of faith, public service, and conservative values. On a final note, as you all know, we live in difficult political times. There may be people here who share the congressman's views and others who do not, but I want to remind everyone that a tenet of lawyering and a core principle of BC law is respectful dialogue. The congressman has graciously agreed to engage with us this afternoon, and I trust we will all join him in a conversation that may lead us toward a better understanding of each other. And to begin that dialogue, I'm also very pleased to welcome our Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professor, former Governor of the Commonwealth, Jane Swift. Governor Swift is part of our community this, sem this semester, teaching a seminar entitled Governing in the Facebook Era, Privacy, Propaganda, and the Public Good. Since many of you heard the Governor's recent talk, I won't uh, repeat the introduction that was given on that particular day, but for those of you who weren't here, you should know that Governor Swift has enjoyed a long-standing public service career as a state senator, lieutenant governor, and a governor. And she's now CEO and president of Learn Launch, an educational nonprofit that focuses on innovation and technological in, in the technological era. So we're grateful to her for being here this semester and participating in today's conversation. So please welcome U.S. Congressman Doug Collins and Governor Jane Swift. Thank you very much. Well, I am uh, thrilled to be here this morning. Um, I got plenty of sleep because the Patriots were not playing in the Super Bowl. It's a, 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 an occurrence we're not used to uh, in yep. these parts, Congressman. We are. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, thank you for coming. Um, I also was inspired into politics uh, by my parents. Uh, my mom was a Catholic school teacher, uh, although a stay-at-home mother for most of that time, and uh, told my dad uh, that she would marry him, but he could never participate in politics as an elected official, uh, but he was a great volunteer. And the best piece of advice he gave me many, uh, one is outdated, he said, don't get into uh, an argument with someone who prints paper by the ream and ink by the <laughs> barrel. Uh, and that no longer really applies. Uh, but he also told me uh, that uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable and not to get into a pissing contest with a skunk. Uh, so anyway, um, those are 
the uh, morals by which I've tried to live my life. I agree. Um, and as that. you can imagine, uh, as a Republican in Massachusetts, I've had uh, quite a bit of practice uh, at trying to operate and legislate in a bipartisan mm -hmm. way. Um, and one of the questions I'd like to start with today is that um, many individuals uh, throughout our country uh, worry about the gridlock in Congress yep. and the fact that it seems uh, folks on the left and the right uh, didn't get my dad's advice uh, <laughs> and don't seem to be able to work across the aisle uh, to forward uh, legislation that's in the public's good. Uh, but um, because I read too much uh, in the newspaper, I noticed that in December, um, there actually was a piece of legislation that passed the House, uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, Trade oh, yeah, Agreement, yes, yeah. uh, that passed with bipartisan support uh, in the midst of the impeachment proceedings. Yes. Uh, and I know that you supported that bill, and um, you're, I'm happy to hear about the details of it, but I'm more interested in um, how you think the lessons from that passage uh, can uh, give us any lessons on how both parties uh, might figure out how to work together better in order to achieve legislative progress for yeah. the American people. Well, thanks. Well, one, thanks uh, for having me here today, and thanks for you coming. Um, I think the, the qu this question starts it out at the very base of who we are. And one of the things that I'll just state up front uh, you know, today is that the bipartisanship is actually there. Um, it's just not seen because both sides and myself included, Democrats included, we all tend to go to our issues that polarize our voting uh, part, the ones that come to us the most. That happens. And as we'll have this conversation today, and I'm looking forward to a conversation today, the one thing that will probably not change is your opinion of me. Probably, if you don't like me, you're not going to change. And my opinion of you is I love you in Boston, and you sent us uh, Matt Ryan to be quarterback. We're glad to have that. <laughs> um, you know, but one of the things and the biggest issues for me is, is how bipartisanship actually can work. How many of you, just curious here, how many of you ever watched the WWE, the wrestling? Some, okay, it's okay to do it in public. The camera's on. I get that. <laughs> um, but... You know, the, it's interesting is, is how they'll, they'll go out and they'll have the, the scene and they'll see everybody and, you know, they do their yelling and, you know, if you go back to the old, I'm old, you know, The Rock and everybody else. Well, there's a, a gentleman on there named A.J. Styles. If you ever, if any of you actually watch, A.J. is one of the champions and has been the champion. I knew A.J. when he was a high school wrestler in uh, Gainesville, Georgia. In fact, I baptized A.J. A.J. has a wife and four beautiful kids. But it's, and I use that as an analogy, but when you see A.J. out there as this, you know, wild wrestler who, you know, does all this, but yet when he comes back home, there's a difference. And I think you've seen this as well in, in legislation. One of my best friends, and it's going to surprise a lot of you in this room, one of my best friends in Congress is Hakeem Jeffries from New York. Hakeem and I talk all the time. We have, put, we have went together on legislation across the board. Hakeem, as you know, well know, has been a very articulate impeachment manager for the House. Um, but Hakeem and I's bipartisanship, and the USMCA was one we didn't work on, but it had real value because it, it affected real people. And where we have become really good friends on was criminal justice reform. I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We also talked about music. Uh, we also authored the Music Modernization Act together, which has rewrote the entire copyright system. On how many of you today, if I'm 99% sure of you, most of you get your music uh, from Spotify, Pandora, Apple, those kind of uh, services. What we found out was happening was is the artists were still getting paid because of where our, our music laws worked, but the songwriters weren't. The very ones who actually wrote the music that we have were, were not getting included in this. So that was a, you know, these are the kind of things that you can work on. At the end of the day, our divisions, what I have seen, and I think you, you talked about the paper and the ink, it's now become a lot easier for people to, quote, engage without being engaged. Because it's easier on social media, it's easier on, uh, Internet, it's easier on the social platforms to engage without uh, having to see anyone. And I think that's has taken both Republican uh, stances and Democratic stances on the polarization issues and took us further apart. And I think that's just a, you know, a, a sad side that we have to deal with. But there are a lot more people that you believe in Congress that really want to get stuff done. And you have to do that bipartisan. Nothing major happens unless it's bipartisan. It took us, by the way, criminal justice reform. Uh, Music Modernization Act, the Cloud Act, which was a data privacy bill. These were all things that Hakeem and I worked on together. Two of those took us almost six years to get done. So let's talk about criminal justice uh, reform. It was actually a commercial uh, last night. Um, one of my daughters actually 
uh, had to read Just Mercy for a class she was in last year, which uh, led me to uh, read it as well and made me aware of the Equal Justice Initiative, which I think has a lot of roots in uh, your home state of Georgia. Um, where are we with criminal justice um, reform? Um, why do you think it's getting support from both sides of the aisle? Because um, if you read Just Mercy, um, I will admit um, some of the policies um, that uh, we are revisiting are ones I supported in the 90s um, from a place of good faith um, because we really believed we were making cities safer and um, the pendulum has swung in the other direction um, and we've had to revisit it, how those have played out. So um, tell me sort of where are we, what else do we have left to do um, and uh, do you think that we will see more fundamental changes in particularly around race and how we treat people in our criminal justice system? I think this, the broad answer to that is yes. I think we are going to see more happen. And, and really one of the first, the first step act, which was a lot of what has been discussed and uh, was signed into law uh, at the end of uh, 2018, and we started seeing uh, people be released, we started seeing the, the criminal justice system begin at least a small turn. Now remember, and, and you, you brought this out, we went from, and for the, anybody who studies law and you look at it from the perspective of, of history, we, we tend to take cycles. We tend to take cycles of, you know, how do we treat those who choose to, out, for whatever reason, walk outside the bounds of, of our laws and, and, and issues. Um, we also see it in, in challenging those issues, some being, you know, rightfully challenged, and, and how do we move forward on that, especially in our issues of, and, but what we, I think, really got a lot of was drugs. You know, the drug uh, epidemic, the, the, how many are in, uh, incarcerated for, uh, many times minor drug offenses that came from addiction and, and the issues that revolve around that. So for First Step Act and for how, where we're at now is I would simply say we're at the beginning. For all of you in here and for some of you of law students eventually, I would predict maybe some, I would hope, or many of you would actually practice criminal law. Um, it's, it's a very worthy and valid uh, profession. I practice some uh, criminal defense work. I've also done some prosecution work. But what you'll find is, is when you look at the folks who come through our system, many times without resources or they're, or they're struggling with their own inner issues, they're going away to jail and 95% of them will be back home. At some point in time, 95% of everyone incarcerated, whether it be at the state, local, or federal uh, facilities, will come back home. So you ask, how does this balance between conservatives and uh, liberals, if you would use those terms, in this? For me, I began to call it an M&M's kind of issue, not the candy, but M&M's, money and morals. For me, it was a look at both sides, and, and Hakeem really expressed this well when we would go into groups. Uh, it was funny. He would come to groups that were conservative groups, and they would look at him suspiciously. I would go to, to many uh, much more liberal groups, and, and they would look at me very suspiciously. But at the end of the day, it was about how are we spending money? And I don't care what political part of the spectrum on you're concerned about that. Are we spending it properly? Are we spending it good? Uh, is it working? Is it doing the things we want it to do? Is it fulfilling a, a process? And then there's the basically moral aspect, and from uh, a faith perspective, that I believe that, I that anyone you look at, no matter where they come from, or if they agree with you or disagree with you, has a fundamental uh, life in them that God has given. So the question is, is how do we now deal with folks who go into jail and give them something to the ability to come back out of jail and not re immediately return to the problems in which they were in. If 95% are coming home, and we're spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to keep them there, then why aren't we using some of those, especially on the federal facilities, now we started in the states, but we started saying on the federal, to actually give them skills, to work on their addictions, to, to let them choose to be a part of a program that can get them out earlier, can get them to halfway houses early, to get them back with their families. We also took on some things, and that was really interesting. We're, we were still shackling females who were giving birth. That was part of our, our and some states still do that as well. And we, but we did away with that in this bill. We also did away, or we put a provision in there that said that if you're going to be uh, incarcerated in a federal facility, we're going to give you every opportunity to be the judge to sentence you closer to home. Because whatever typically family structure there is in a person's life, the closer they are to connect with that and to keep those connections will help when they get out. So that's we just started this. Now, other areas that's got to happen, minimum, you know, mandatory minimums. These issues have got to be dealt with. Uh, we went way too far uh, on uh, that. And you know where it actually came from? I believe it came from we didn't trust the judicial system to give us the outcome we wanted. 
And so there was this discussion on if, if somebody went away and they, quote, got a sentence that was lesser than what we thought they should, then we blame the judge. Well, we've got to, so we've got to get back to a part in, this, in our society, uh, even in states that elect judges, we've got to get back to a side where that judge is there as a, uh, uh, not necessarily, the, is the neutral arbiter probably is the best way to put it, but I, I think the next steps is how we deal with the drug offenses, how we deal with mandatory minimums, and then, you know, continuing the process of, and a whole other line of this is how communities police and, and we go, I'm a state trooper's kid. My dad was a state trooper for 30 something years, so I, I come in from that side of the, the house, and dad and I used to have some of the just most amazingly different arguments about this, uh, about this issue. So I'm going to um, go to technology. I have two more uh, questions, and I am going to open it um, up to questions. I want to make sure we leave plenty of time. You already mentioned this. Uh, the dean mentioned I'm teaching a course about technology, the velocity of change, right? Our world is changing so quick. Government doesn't act fast. Um, how are we doing keeping up with, you mentioned, uh, the issue of music streaming. Um, there's also the issue of election technology, uh, the opportunity uh, for s cyber intrusions. How are we doing on those fronts? Um, if you take all three, okay. <laughs> I think it's the best way to put it. But if you, if you block them down into, into different spots, I think one of the interesting issues here is today, and it would be interesting if I could just take uh, and hand out a piece of paper to everyone here, because I see a lot of different age groups here. And there's the age group of mine, and I'm over 50, and I'll say there's everybody else is under 50, so you're all you know, good. Um, J-Lo made that okay last night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you can move like that at 50, I don't care what age you are. You know, come July when she turns, yeah, I said I felt bad at 53. Okay, um, you know, the, but I think what is interesting is, is, is for those of us over, uh, you know, in my age group, or even a little bit under, there's this idea that you have a privacy, that you just don't go out and share everything. One of the, the craziest arguments I have, I have a daughter who is 27, she has spina bifida. Jordan has never walked, she has a little bit of a learning and disability uh, because of that with her memory. Her short term memory is almost non-existent on time, but her long term memory is perfect. She could tell you what she did 10 years ago, she couldn't tell you what she ate for breakfast uh, some days. And it used to bother her, but what I mean by that is she'll get on social media and share everything about it. And she thinks nothing about it. But then it's not just her. She has a 23-year-old brother and a 21-year-old brother who also will say, hey, I'm going to here, and you know, I don't like what X is wearing, and you know, just making opinions known. And I think that's become an interesting discussion that we have now with these giant tech companies. What do they have and what, and we're dealing with this as David Cicilline, uh, our partner on, in the majority now, in the committee, we're doing what we call tech antitrust hearings. And the issue is, is how do you take now a Google, a Facebook, a, you know, these, you know, bigger platforms, uh, Twitter, these that, that really move media and move, you know, opinions, how do you fit them into either a government regulatory scheme or not? Should government be a part of it or not? They're hiding behind right now, and I say hiding not pejoratively, but just saying so, in a, what's called a safe harbor provision from the DMCA from, from the 90s, before any of these social media platforms that were there. And what that platform says is, is that if you own a website, it could be New York Times, it could be your Boston uh, University College website, it could be, that you're not held responsible for comments or things that are made on there, okay? You're, you're held responsible for your platform, but you're not held responsible for the comments. So that's how Twitter, Facebook, and others are, are not for things that are put out or postings of others. Um, the problem has become, and Governor, this is an interesting one. These used to be, when they started, remember how they were set up. They were basically the billboards or the bulletin boards that you see walking through your hallways. Everybody could come along and stick their, you know, their event up, their party up, or their, or their study group up. And but what happened was nobody on the bulletin board, for the bulletin board per se, wouldn't say, well, I don't like these on my bulletin board, and that's the bulletin board having a mind, and saying the next one that comes up, I'm going to replace one. But that's exactly what's happening now with our social media issues is there is now a determination of what we will put on, what we won't put on, who's hidden and who's not, both liberal and conservative. This is, goes, it's, a, it's a spectrum issue. So the question is, is there a way or a right for government to be a part of that? And is there an antitrust violation? This, we're not talking about you know, big steel and railroads from the, the late 1800s, although it's a very much of a correlation. One thing that also, from a privacy perspective, I feel like if we don't engage it now, there is a loss of 
my generation's ability to understand that you don't want to have people controlling medical data, life data, and everything else in a certain area to a generation that grew up with just having that all out there. I think there needs to be a good balance between both groups. So it's, it, that one's going to be a tough one, and we could spend all day on that one. Or all semester. All semester. Uh, <laughs> come to the class. It's great. Won't be able to be here, but come to class. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to my last question, and then I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. Um, just uh, before I do, as you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to go to students first. And I am going to enforce the question. So um, I am going to ask you to ask a question, not to make a speech. For those of you who want to make speeches, you have a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we live in a democracy, and you can run for office. Um, <laughs> So uh, my last question is uh, the issue that is obviously on everybody's mind uh, and is dominating the headlines, which is impeachment. Um, you voted against impeachment, uh, and the trial uh, continues uh, in the Senate. And given the evidence um, that was available and presented, I think uh, folks in this room, um, particularly the aspiring lawyers and the uh, law school professors, would like to know how you re reached your conclusion to vote against impeachment, um, how you think the Senate trial is being handled, is it being handled correctly, um, and if there's anything that you regret about the process. And then, because I'm not a lawyer, um, my question, and this is a four-part question, uh, I may, is... I may, I may have to come back and get you to repeat yeah. part of these questions. Uh, <laughs> what advice, after everything is said and done, would you give to the president? Okay. Um, can I start there and just go back to the rest? Okay. I would, I would, here's what I'd tell to him, and, and have. Keep your head down, do your job, and don't at times worry about as much noise as, as is going on. He likes to engage, he likes to fight, we all know that, but I think in this part coming up with an election, mine is just to, this is gonna take its course, it's gonna run its course, and just to do you know, the job that he's set forth to do, whether it be economy, trade, you know, all those things, focus on those, the rest will be the political process on the Hill. That's the last part. Let's go back to impeachment for a second. The one thing I can assure you is there's not anybody in this room if I went, if I was sitting here last, and I and I say this with all belief, not that it's a hundred percent fact, so I didn't say everybody, but I think most in this room, if we were here on August first of last year, after Mueller was done, after a phone call was actually done that we did not know about at the time, but on August first, if I was just to ask a question and say, how many of you think the president ought to be impeached? Those of you who felt that would feel that way on August first. And for those of you who felt like he may not have been, should have been impeached, you would have felt he shouldn't have been impeached on August 1st. You have to set the framework of impeachment into these uh, parameters because that's exactly the, the parameters that went through in, in the House as we went through. That's why I think the questions about the Senate process cannot be divorced from the facts, number one, but also the process in the House. Let's take, uh, I'm just going to hit the, the, the highlights here. The biggest thing is the transcript got out. I think that was the very first thing that was not expected in this. No one expected the president to actually declassify a call that he had with a foreign leader um, in that part. He didn't. And um, in fact, when it was put out, and if you remember, the call for the impeachment process was September 24th, and less than 24 hours later, that call was out. Then we began to see what was in the whistleblower complaint as compared to what was in the call, and we went from there. The process issue, and this is, and I, I'm not, don't really frankly care which side you fall on. You impeach him, not impeach him. But as lawyers, or future lawyers in this room, there are issues, especially in the House side of process, that you do have, you know, in, in understanding it's not a grand jury, it's not a criminal proceeding, it's not something, this is a very much of a political proceeding going forward. But there, the one thing, and this actually ties back to your very first question, the only thing that bonds us together in any format in the Congress is the ability to have civil discussions without calling each other every name that we want to call, without using derogatory language, without doing in, in a in a debate setting. It also keeps us from having to. This is why the minority rights matter, why majority rights matter, and the only thing that we have in the middle is actually how to uh, keep those uh, discussions going. That was just completely 
done over in, in the House. Now, whether you think the President should have been impeached for this phone call, I respect that. I disagree with you uh, politely, but I, I, I just say this. For Adam Schiff, when he went over to the Senate and actually to say after one, and this was a, a comment that I saw this the other day, when the House, uh, the President's impeachment lawyers made the comment in the motion hearing that they shouldn't, and he gets up and says, the reason we didn't uh, subpoena Mr. Bolton was, is immediately he'd tell us he'd sue us. And then it would just be dragged out. Okay, for those of you, let me just, again, take yourself out of impeachment for just a second. You're going to be a lawyer practicing. Some of you are already lawyers practicing. How many of you want to be able to take something that you have off, which was in the right of Mr. Bolton to claim and say, I'm not going to come? Remember, he also got onto a lawsuit with Mr. Kupperman, who said, I'm torn between two masters. I'm torn between the president. I'm torn between Congress. Courts tell me which one. In fact, after the, uh, Mr. Bolton joined in and Mr. Mulvaney, there's a whole process here, the House actually withdrew that suit. If impeachment is so important, and it was supposed to be you know, the, the issue that we have to do it now, is it worth going over the rules of the House to get it to that point, when at the end of the day, for many of you have heard me say this, because I'm sure some, many of you have seen me because I was the lead in the House. At the end of the day, the money got there, the president of Ukraine said there was no pressure, there was no conditionality, and at the end of the day, when the call actually occurred, there was no knowledge that was brought forth. Even John Bolton met with President Zelensky and them in the end of August, and for all the things that may or may not be in this book that, he's, you know, that is coming forth, and transcript that is supposedly out there, he never brought it up with President Zelensky. Never brought this up, and Tim Morrison, who actually did testify, testified to this. So I think that, you know, look, you can get, we can go down the path of facts, we can go down the path of what, you know, the perceived facts, this is what law school is about, you take this side of facts, I'll take this side of facts, we'll argue. But I think that at the end of the day, if the House case was truly about impeaching this president, it would have taken longer, number one, than 78 days, 71 of which the president and the White House had no involvement, 71 days, had they had no possibility of involvement. Some of you are going, I mean, again, no matter what you feel about this president, that's not the way to do this. And sometimes we compare it to Clinton or to Nixon. I remind you, the Starr report had been almost three years in the making. The president had every opportunity. President Clinton and his attorneys had been intimately involved with that case. So when it came to the House, as the report, they were already a part, and by then were actually allowed to participate in, in that process. In fact, uh, Ken Starr was actually questioned at a judiciary hearing by President Clinton's attorney. We tend to, you know, those are just the differences here. So I think in, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is uh, the president uh, on Wednesday, some point on Wednesday, the votes will take place and he, they will not get two thirds. He will be acquitted of the impeachment charges brought on both counts. I do believe it will be a bipartisan acquittal. I, d I don't believe it's going to be simply party lines. I do believe that what we've seen so far it will be bipartisan, which, by the way, it was only bipartisan against in the House. So, again, without going into living it for the last five and a half months and going into every single detail. And if you want to ask a specific question, I'll be happy to talk about it. The question is, is what do we gain here? Was this, you know, was this an impeachable offense or not? Alan Dershowitz has claimed and been vociferously claiming that it was an impeachable offense. Now, we agree or disagree there. But there was one comment by a couple of the witnesses that actually stuck out with me. And that was Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Uh, when he said at the end of the day after question many times, he actually said, uh, I didn't like the policy. And if you had Mr. Taylor and, and others also said, we didn't like the policy. We've been here. We, we wanted to be more of a part of it. Policy differences are not impeachable offenses. And I think that's the part that concerns me the most is what is the next step here? Whether you want this president out or not. I remember being there in the House in the majority when President Obama was in office. And some on our side said, let's impeach him for DACA. Let's impeach him for whatever. And most of the time said, no, we're not going to do that. And we never brought it forward. This is my concern that we grow, we've rose to the level of impeachment is no longer the, the end result. It has become what many of the founders talked about. And that is if you have the majority, you can impeach someone. And so, it, like I said, it's, that's, that's where we're at. We're going to see this done. And at the end of the day, if it was about a 2020 election, I'm not sure it helped either side. All right, we're uh, moving to questions. 
Um, I have a transgender brother, and I would like to know, on um, myself and on behalf of him, why you do not oppose, why you do not support the Equality Act and expanding trans rights in, for Americans. Thank you. Uh, the I, my biggest concerns with the Equality Act was a lot of processes in the Equality Act in which we articulated during the debate. And, I, and the biggest issues that we had was, one, how our current system is set up uh, in this. I don't believe anybody should be discriminated against no matter what they choose and how they, and how they are. And that's just not what my concerns are. But there were things in the bill, and we brought these things out and we said there were probably issues that we could work on, but they, when you get into how... Uh, they were affecting different groups, whether it be in law enforcement, whether it be in uh, social services, how those were actually affected. And hearing from a different side, one of our concerns was in the hearings, it was, and rightfully so, the Democrats had the majority, they could do whatever they wanted to do, but there was none of these uh, discussions taking place and to have, you know, how this would affect, you know, a, uh, some of our folks who provide, back, you know, sheltered, shelters for those who are being abused. How does it affect our jails? How does it affect and how we can work those things out? There were just a lot of questions from that perspective that were not worked out in legislation. Remember, ideas are out here. Words on paper are another thing. And words on paper was what we had to vote on. And those were the issues from my perspective that were not answered. And it's also one of the reasons the bill has never gotten picked up in the Senate at this point and probably won't. I go back to my very first statement here. To get things done, we've got to work together. And I can agree and disagree with the positions, but I actually can find ways to, to find common ground. In this argument, we were never even allowed to find those common grounds. I just had a question about, uh, I guess, money and politics. You just announced you be going up against an appointed incumbent. Yes. And my understanding is that the majority leader's pack is already spending. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, being on the other side of that, how do, how do you, how do you, what do you make of money and politics? Uh, it's as natural as breathing in politics, but it doesn't. But if it was if it was the most important thing, Mike Bloomberg would be the next president. If it was the most important thing, Tom Steyer would be more than one percent and two percent in the polls. Okay, and I don't mean that to be you know derogatory about it, but I'm I'm getting ready for those of you watching, and I know for some of you you're hoping I you know that'd be get beat, but the lady I'm running against has <laughs> had to come to me, so she's going to be as conservative in that side. What I see is this. The issues of money and how we deal with it in politics is the still miss the bottom line of the, the, you've got to have ideas that actually match whatever you're saying. And this goes back to the class that you're teaching. You know, how do we, you know, adjust this? It's sort of always been there. But also the, the, the question is, is keeping people out, keeping, you know, how it be groups or other things from not using resources that they have, is that a better way to go about it? I don't think so. Look, I'm getting ready to have anywhere from 20 to, I've heard estimates from the other side, 20 to 40 million dollars dumped on my head. I don't have a, I'm, I'm a trooper's kid from North Georgia. I got a wife that teaches school and I got three kids. I can't put that kind of money in this account. But what I can do is put, raise what I can to get my message out there. Uh, I'm not going to fault anybody for having it, but I think that, that, I think people are beginning to see through that as well as we go forward. And you, that's part of our process. Because my concern is, is where do you stop it? You know, at a certain point in time, do you say anybody with this wealthy put their own money can't run for office? Or do you say that everybody puts in? Then you get into control on who gets to spend that money and how they get to spend it. Um, I just want to say thank you, Doug. Um, I used to, uh, I actually came into this opposing um, or supporting the impeachment of President Trump. But I think the points you made actually convinced me to your side. So I do appreciate that. Um, my question is a bit of a two-parter. Is climate change real, and to what extent have humans contributed to it? Uh, climate change is real, and humans are contributing to it just as other factors in our environment have. I, I've never denied that humans do not have a, uh, a role in climate change. In fact, we are a part of it. I've never denied that, never will. I think the question becomes is how do we deal with our involvement in it? And going back through history and, and the science is showing you know, the, uh, the impact that we're having now, one of the biggest concerns for, for many is uh, taking the United States involvement, how far we've come, and you know, one of the, and, and as far as also dealing with our other players in the world. So I think from an economic standpoint, I've never denied that there is uh, human influence in, in climate change. Do we need to be good stewards of our environment? Yes, I come from an agricultural background. 
There's nobody in this world more attuned to having a good and a clean environment than if you come to my district in northeast Georgia, which is in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And those farmers who took clay fields using good practice and, and, it, and resources and conservation to make them green again. So I, I, I think we've got to find a balance in which we get the, you know, the world to finding ways to do this, finding good alternative sources of energy, finding good uh, to ways to move across uh, the divide of saying it has to be simply fossil fuels or it has to be alternative energy sources. If we continue that down that divide, we're going to go nowhere. I think we need to move toward uh, moving the, the market where we can have different alternative energies, but at the same time acknowledging our, uh, the dependence on where we are and how much better are we now than where we were. I, one of my jobs that I had before I ever got into, uh, actually went to out of high, uh, college, was I did gas detection monitoring. And one of those things was taking and coming up here in New England, and we had you'd stick a, a tube in a, a, st a smokestack, and you adjusted the boiler based on the smoke coming out. So the, uh, the 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 levels have been going down consistently. We've got to look for better ways to continue to do it. One of the interesting things is, is from our perspective, we have a, a Lake Lanier, which fun, which has, from an environmental standpoint, has the water supply for Atlanta and and others. And one of our problems is, is we had. We've gotten down now to where some of the regulatory burden that was put on us, we can't even actually measure the amount down of phosphates. It's, you can't do it in free environment. You don't know how much it actually is. So I think we need to continue to work toward it, but also at the same time sacrificing you know, business and other interests that we have when the rest of the, country, the world is not is a concern for mine. I'll go back to one that it shows me, to me in that area. And I, I appreciate I've actually maybe convinced one person on the impeachment. Maybe not on this, but I still like it. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate at least the part. Um, it was interesting to me a few years ago when we did the China agreement, and China agreed to, to in 2030 to quit, uh, to start their cutback on their coal uh, plants. What was interesting was there, that was the year that they had planned on their last uh, plant to be built anyway. So when under this agreement, we had to start stuff immediately. They were already planning until 2030. They actually didn't come anywhere on the table and got to build every one of their coal plants. And for those of us who've actually been to Beijing and Guangzhou and Shenzhen, you can't breathe. So why would we allow them to go to 2030 and when we had to start immediately? That was part of my problem. Do you have a question? I think that'll... Uh, he got a mic. As uh, they always say, this is my mic and I paid for it. No. <laughs> I've got a He's in your class. I love it. I've got a question regarding impeachment. Um, okay. I, Hopefully this is not uh, bipartisan uh, by any means, but you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Are you concerned that the road that either party's going on is going to lead to such hatred that regardless of which president, which party's president is in, which party's in control of the House, there's going to be more and more impeachments that may or may not have any validity? Yes, very much so. It, look, I'm an institutionalist in the House, and I have friends across the aisle who are, are Democrat friends who privately the conversations we have are is where have we come to? You know, what is the standard now? And I didn't answer part of your question, I apologize, the four part, I think it was number three about the Senate trial. And I think it's the per perfect place to answer this. Because people are saying it's not a fair trial if you didn't have witnesses. Okay, with all due respect, how could it be a fair trial if we didn't get to participate in the House? So you have a, 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 a burnished product being delivered to the Senate and then you're going to say, well, do it now. When all, they, they, you know, what's interesting is they've not asked for any information that wasn't a possibly involvement for them in the fall. Nothing was new, except they wanted to get it over. And this is why mo a lot of folks believe it to be a political impeachment, because they were just using it for the political value, because they knew going in. And look, I'm a believer. Sometimes you just have to do, you may have to impeach someone in the House and it not go through the Senate. I, I'm, that's okay. I'm never, as a House member, and I, maybe if I get to the Senate, I'll change this view, but I don't believe you should not pass something in the House just because it's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. Sometimes you've got to stand on your own, and I have a, I really respect for that. But again, two numbers to stick in your head. 78 days, 71 of which the White House or the President's Council had zero, zero involvement. Not that they were offered. They had no involvement. So that's where, and that's the difference in all the other things that concerns me greatly. I was wondering, uh, what do you believe government's role in regulating social media is, and if government even has a role in regulating that? Wow, you want to be on my staff? That's the qu <laughs> no, that's the question I have right now. This is the question, actually, uh, Representative Cicilline, and I just had this conversation on the floor uh, just the other day, and we've had it publicly, so I'm not sharing a confidence here. Uh, 
David wants to have a, another big hearing in which we bring the CEOs in. I think it's a complete waste of time. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg's hearing was a complete waste of time. Okay? I mean, great guy, smart, amazing, golly, do something, go make a billion dollars, I don't care, but at least come in and know what your company does. Okay? But it's not his job anymore. So what we're trying to do is find out from the engineers, from their ad people, how does it affect the infrastructure underneath? A conservative and, and even a, and, and a, or a liberal moderate, you need to know how this is affecting us. But from a conservative perspective, my touch on government is not too much, but just enough. But why? Because I do not want the government determining in some wild way what this speech is or how much money can, you know, that just shouldn't be our role because we've seen that happen before and it, it, it doesn't work real well. We've seen it in criminal justice form. That government hand to make everybody feel safe was not the best thing. I think we're going to have to find the, the, the middle ground here is that I believe Section 230, that safe harbor provision, has got to be adjusted. And I've told Sundar, who's head of Alphabet now, but he's head of Google. I've told uh, Zuckerberg. I've told all of them. You're gonna, you can't keep coming to Congress and saying we are not willing to discuss this. That's just like saying, you know, I, we would like everything we do. We're not going to uh, to bother with it. But they're going to have to discuss it. They're going to have to take some ownership here, and in, in what's on their sites. They are, what's amazing is they'll tell you they can't do it, but I'll tell you where they can do it. And they do it in child pornography. They do it in uh, runaways. They do it in they do it in safety stuff. So the actual things are still there. Copyright and others are another issue that uh, we need to talk about as well. I, this is something we could do all day, and I, I appreciate the question. Hi, Representative Collins. Um, my question today is about your Senate run. I'm curious how you believe that it will um, benefit the GOP in 2020 to win back the majority and help the party long term when um, the incumbent senator is able to fundraise herself, so it's diverting funds away from other important races like Michigan, New Hampshire, Arizona, um, and also given the underrepresentation of women in the GOP, yeah. why you think now is an important time to try and challenge a woman who's done yeah. a great job so far in the Senate. Well, number one, uh, Senator Leffler is, is, a, is a fine person. It's not about her, and it's not about her being a female or a male. This was something I, we came to a discussion on in our family and, and deciding why you need to run. Um, it's about ideas. And, and here, I've been all over the country over the last few years. I was a, the vice chair of the Republican Conference uh, in the House, which means I used to travel all over the country helping candidates in not uh, seats like mine. Look, we have this. Think about the Boston area where you have seats that there is no hope of a Republican winning it. I mean, just not even a hope. And, I, and then flip it, and you get my seat in Georgia, in which there's no hope of a Democrat winning it. Um, but I have been traveling to all across the country, and I'll have to say, from a conservative perspective, going to seats like Don Bacon's seat in Omaha, Nebraska, where it's a 50 50 seat. And the question is, is, is having conversations just like this where we can agree and disagree. But also saying, here's why I believe a conservative message works. This is why I believe that compassion is actually lifting people up. That's why I believe that these messages resonate on fiscal uh, uh, conservatism and, and, and the issues that we have. The governor in the state of Georgia had a constitutional pick, and I, I applaud him for that. But you all, it's also an interesting fact that I do also believe that the people of Georgia ought to have a choice as well. And that's the alternative that we have, not that we're uh, against anything, because what's interesting was is she was picked, um, and one of the governor's reasons was is they wanted to appeal to the voters who didn't vote for Trump. And within her opening speech, it was, I'm pro-Second Amendment, pro-life, and I'm pro-Trump. How does that do that? It, it doesn't. I think there's ways that we can talk about criminal justice reform, how we talk about data privacy, how we talk about you know, other issues of compassion and concern with people that actually bring voters to your side and not just simply going into it. One of the other things you said is she can fund herself. Does that take money away from everybody else? Well, that would be if she'd invest somewhere else. But again, you know, again, when you're, one of your first thoughts is, I'm going to put $20 million into the campaign, that was done for one reason and one reason alone, to scare me and others out. Uh, I still believe that this is a country in which ideas matter. But for me, it, my wife and I did a speech uh, about three or four weeks ago. And I've been struggling with this. This was not an easy decision for my family. I get up every morning, and it's still a struggle. For those of us who put our name on the ballot, how many, just curious, how many in this room have run for something outside of a school lady? You've actually put your name on a ballot for outside. I respect every one of you in here. That is a big step because it's your name out there. And people will talk about you. They'll make fun of you. They'll do it. I mean, it, it, it's fine. I, I do take offense when they go on my Instagram account and start talking about my daughter. Now, I, I, I do take offense at that. But 
past that, you can call me whatever you want to. I don't have horns. I didn't shave them all before I came here this morning. Um, but the, the interesting issue is, is I believe that there's still a place to stand up and make your case. And if we don't, then we're only going to have those who can afford to get into elections. And I don't know about you. I can't do that. And some of you may be able to, but I can't. But I think it's a value. I'm sorry. There you go. Um, you've spoken today about the value of bipartisan conversations mm -hmm. and that many civil conversations across, our, across the aisle are held by on the public view. However, I'd like to ask you today about President Trump, who you have routinely supported, mm -hmm. who continues to use derogatory and incendiary language towards women, foreign nationals, world leaders, local leaders, and the electorate during his presidency, both in person and on Twitter. Do you support President Trump's use of hateful rhetoric and believe that his language is in line with the values of our democracy and that of our chief executive? I do not agree with everything President Trump puts out at all. Um, but also, let's, as we look at this, let's also, I'm going to take my dear friend. Okay, I agree with some stuff, and there's some stuff on Twitter. I know that this little sheet of paper has some of mine that people don't like. I get that. But it is amazing to me the blowback that's come on some of the things that I've said, and I'll just take myself, because I don't answer for the president. The country will to deal with him. There's things I support about his policies, and I've, I've supported those. That's not a secret. But it is interesting to me that my friend Hakeem Jeffries, who I consider close as a brother, is able to say that the Grand Wizard lives at 1600, and everybody lets it pass. Now, let's, let's, now, we both say things, and, I, and I'm going I'm to hit something here in this, in this room, because, because for some, I, I'm just going to say something. There's something also missing in politics, and it happened to me about, th about three weeks ago. We do a lot of interviews, okay, and you get caught up in interviews. If you've never done it, if you've never got caught up and said something you shouldn't have said, frankly, you're not being truthful yourself, much less anybody else. And one night, after the Soleimani issue and everything else, I was trying to make a point, and I said, that they love terrorists, and the implication was Democrats, okay? Since then, after coming back and saying, that wasn't what I should have said, and I was wrong in saying it, I came out and apologized. And I apologized to anybody in this room publicly that I did. It was not something I should have said. What is unique is, a lot of times that's the, that's the, the, the abnormal instead of the normal. And... For me, it calls me, I'm at peace with saying I'm sorry, because I, by the way, it wasn't in my Bible, but I pastored for 11 years in a Baptist church in Georgia, and I had come up, people come up to me all the time, they say, Pastor Doug, I want to ask you a question. My first words were to say, I'm sorry, and they sort of laugh at me, and they say, what do you mean I'm sorry? I said, because I've offended you probably at some point. So I just said, let's just get it out of the way. I'm sorry, let's see how we can work on it better. But this, you know, so, I mean... Let's all take a responsibility for our own uh, comments and actions, and I've tried to do that as best I could. I want to go to people who haven't already um, spoken. Uh, this question is directed towards uh, Jane Swift. So what is your opinion on Massachusetts becoming a sanctuary state? Uh, so I have not taken a position on it because I haven't been in elected office. Um, so I really haven't studied it that much, but... Um, so I haven't really taken a position. Do you see any like negative consequences with Massachusetts being a sanctuary state? Uh, so I mean, there are negative consequences if you lose federal funding. Ezra. Great to hear from you. I was wondering, especially as someone uh, running a new election this year, are you at all worried about election security, especially? Uh, through technological innovation? Yeah, it, it is. I, I, I'm worried on two points. I'm worried as, as we all are about, you know, the election security and making sure we have free and fair elections. That's, that is uh, a part. I'm also worried about the, and this is a bigger issue, because Georgia's been front and center. Um, believe it or not, Stacey Abrams and I are, are good friends. We came into the Georgia legislature at the same time. I could, I could pick up my phone back there, have Will give me my phone. I could call her right now and she'd answer the phone. She could talk to y'all. Y'all probably, some of y'all like that a lot better than me. Uh, I get it. Um, but, but we're friends. I disagree with her greatly, though, on the characterization of what happened in Georgia and this election issue on who was off and who was not. Um, and we could go into that long term. But I have a question for everybody in here. How is it that all of you in here have no problem trusting a website to buy your whatever with your credit card information, with everything else, you have no problem going back and forth, with that, but yet we can't come to find a, a solution for elections that can be done with advanced technology beyond a piece of paper and a pencil. That's a you know, yeah, well, 
I think the issue is, is but you know, I have it in Georgia where you know the the whole Democratic establishment said that there was problems in the election, and the problem is, is everything that went forward. It was really interesting in our state where they were accused of the Secretary of State, who's now our governor, was accused of doing things which were local decisions. And you know what? Most of the counties that had problems were democratically controlled counties. That's never put out there. Um, Stacey Abrams and I actually, you know, had voted on a, a bill that uh, brought back the number of uh, early voting days. And she had no problem with it. In fact, she voted for it because we saw that there was no impact in the folks who were voting. In fact, it had a better impact on those of minorities and others actually voting. I'm very proud of this in Georgia, that African-American male, African-American female, Hispanic male, and Hispanic female, the lowest increase in the last, since 2014, was about 12% of those voting groups. The highest was almost uh, 25 to 30%. So in this time in which Georgia supposedly was going and taking all these people off the, you know, and not letting people vote, the, the minority increase and the, actually the, the total increase was increasing every year. So it's easy to hit talking points. I'm going to tell you, if I, can, I, don't, I think we're getting close. I don't know if we're at time or if not. We'll take more questions. But I'm going to tell you this. I don't care what side you're on. Quit believing bumper stickers. I don't care what side you're on. Bumper stickers will only get you in trouble and get you sticky. Okay, because you, a simple answer don't apply in most things anymore. A simple three or four or five word answer is not going to get you where you need to be. I don't care if you're the most liberal person in the world or the most conservative person in the world. There has to be honest dialogue in which we can walk out of a room and say, I despise everything that that guy just said, but I respect the fact that we're in America where we can say it. And that's the only thing that's going to get us through. Because if we keep going to, the, to the, our corners, and I'm going to be partisan, don't expect me not to be. Because I don't expect Hakeem Jeffries not to be. Hakeem and I got on the phone one night, and we go at each other like brothers. And I said, why are you doing this? I said, we can't get this done. He said, why are you doing what you're doing? And we go back and forth. That's the way it's supposed to be. So don't think it shouldn't. Conservatives aren't evil. Liberals aren't evil. We're Americans. Figure it out. Let us be partisan. In fact, I don't want you not to be who you are. Because if you are, you're giving up part of you. If you're not who you believe, then you're giving up part of you. But at the same point in time, apply to politics what you apply to everything else. Apply to politics what you apply to everything else. None of you go to buy a car and say, I'm going to pay for a $1,000 car, I'm only going to pay $500. And when the guy at the dealership says, nope, you're going to pay $1,000, you know, say, well, I, you know, I'm going to do it. Or if you're in business, you walk away from business. We do this every day. Why are we not able to do this in politics? There's no business deal that ever gets done that typically starts with everybody agreeing. Find a way around it. That may not be good for some to hear, but if we don't, the group sitting here 30 years from now will ask us what happened to us. Uh, uh, there's the, our intelligence service has told that the Russians interfered with the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. um, and they've also told us that this notion of Ukraine interfering was, uh, came from the Russians. So uh, what, what do you think about Putin? What do you think about whether or not they did indeed interfere with the 2016? What do you think of the intelligence service? And what do you think of this whole notion that the Ukrainians interfered with our election in 2016, who, who happened to be at war with the Russians, so that yeah. they obviously felt the need to blame them. Thank you. You know what's going to surprise you? I agree with everything you said. And I, and I, and I, and I do. And I think that, but the interesting qualification here, and there's no qualification, Putin is an old KGB. I mean, this man is old school Russia. Please go back to your 70s and 80s books. Don't believe the hype about what he's doing now. Okay, he is old school. And I'm in the military. I'm still a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I, I, look, this, this, I was in Iraq in 2008. I served a tour over there during that time. They are as bad actors, but also they just didn't interfere in 2016. They've been interfering in 2012. They've been interfering in 2010. They've been a part of this for a while. The Ukrainian part, I think there's been a lot of, of wrongful discussion. I'll admit that Ukraine is a country, you know, from the a mass pop, didn't. I mean, they're having hard enough time just keeping it on. Certain... The, the problem that comes up is that certain Ukrainian officials like wrote letters against the president and things like that. That's, that's not an interesting issue. But you know what bothers me? 
is I agree with you, and, and most on our side, especially on, even on the Judiciary Committee, which is as polarized as it comes, we agree on these kind of issues, but yet every time we had a chance to discuss or bring up election security, which is in our wheelhouse, we did not do it. In fact, the only thing we brought up was domestic legislation, then which we had more, and if you read the honestly in the legislation, became more of a nationalized election structure, and that's why we had a lot of disagreement. But we never had the hearings and discussions on the cybersecurity and the issues that you're having. So from my perspective, you and I actually agree. I just can't get my chairman to agree with me that we need to talk about it. So, you know, look, they're all going to. You've only hit two. You miss some. China, North Korea, Iran. I mean, these are all uh, actors and players on the world market that attempt to now, in very real, tangible ways, because of the question that was earlier in the talk we talked about before, social media. You can come at it from anywhere. The bots, the, the everything that's there. And so, yeah, so it's, I agree with you. I, we're not in disagreement on that. In our classes, and I have a hard time, as my students know, saying this word, metrication. But for whatever reasons, um, when we look at a particular site on social media, if it's got lots of shares, if it's got lots of likes, we assume it's legitimate. We assume there's something. Uh, and the IRA has gotten very good at playing that game. Um, I hearken back to when I was a candidate, uh, different rules being applied in the media when you got close to elections. Has the Congress yeah, thought about perhaps some metrication issues that might um, give us some chance to dampen down the uh, influence of all kinds of forces, but also just make people come to their own uh, opinion about a particular article or post because you just take away the metrication? Yeah, I wish we could. I mean, the, the problem is right now is, is and, and I say this jokingly, I can put a New York Times front page. You'll have half the Republicans say it's New York Times fake news. You'll have everybody on the Democrat side say it's, it's the gospel truth. I mean, we've, we've gotten into this problem. But I think what you've hit on is something that we really need to, to pay attention to is, if, and actually I was at Facebook when this first came up. I actually talked to their head chief of security before the last election, and we were discussing this on some copyright issues, but he was talking about the fact that in uh, Russia they have actual just big, you know, giant buildings where, you know, thousands of people go in and that's all they do. They just take over accounts, they form new accounts, they do the bots, this is all part. The question though comes in a blackout period, and this is, this is concerning, because our blackout period deals with official communication. So like if you're in office, you, and what, if you don't know about that, I can't do a official newsletter 90 days before an election. And that's good because the official resource is being used probably, in a, not probably, it is used in a, in a uh, uh, political way. By the way, also let's go back to something. There's nothing you did or I do for that, that we take on that doesn't help us politically. We're, for anybody here to say that some, a, a representative, congressman, governor, president, or anybody else that does not do something that helps them politically is frankly not being honest with themselves because it, it all is. You're not going to do something against your best interest. But in this area right here, how do you go into Facebook or how do you go to Twitter or how do you go to Instagram or to TikTok or to uh, YouTube or any other and say at a certain point in time, we're going to not let you have your opinion. We're not going to let you be able to post on this. And that becomes the real question. We've, again, it's taking it out this realm of, of the traditional media. This is the kind of conversations that I wish we were having. These are the kind of conversations that are going to affect my children and my grandchildren. And at a certain point in time, it's only going to get more. I mean, for everybody in here who has a smartphone, those, you're, you're barely older, you're older, much older than the smartphone. Most of you in here, think about that a second. In 2000, 2001, we just had the internet. You at least had to have a computer and a dial-up. Now all you have to do is have something in your pocket. And you can have more activity and, and, and to turn more events than anything that you have. Um, so the class you're teaching sounds amazing. For those of you taking it, you're at the cutting edge of asking these questions. Ask those questions, and I'd love to hear your input. Send it to me, and, and we'll talk about how, how does that actually become something we can look at. Red. Um, it sounds like, uh, sorry. It sounds like you've uh, reflected a lot more um, of an understanding of humanity uh, in Congress uh, between people who are on other sides, uh, sorry, uh, opposite sides of the aisle. Um, but it seems like you also, uh, members of Congress, don't really reflect that understanding of humanity and the other side um, 
when you're on TV and when, and when people are really paying attention. It seems like that stuff happens behind closed doors. Um, it does. But uh, I think that it, it, it has a real effect on, on society because it seems like your constituents uh, follow your example and it's the example they see. Um, so I guess, do you think people like you and, and uh, Representative Jeffries, um, who are leaders in your parties, sort of have a responsibility to um, demonstrate some of your understanding of humanity that's outside of uh, a political ideology um, in front of people and not just when the doors are closed and the lights are off? Uh, because um, it, seems like, it seems like we'd all be doing a lot better if we didn't think we had to hate the other side because that's what that's what our leaders yeah. showed us I, I, look that's a great question and it's and it's a and it's a, and it's a heartfelt one you know from a perspective of saying i don't get to do this 90 percent of my interviews you remember when you were in elect office those have been like you don't get to do this kind of long form okay you get a you get an interview question you get 90 seconds at, i mean that's a long one to respond to something it's why our debates are pretty much a crock as well okay you know but so at a certain point in time, I will agree with you. And when you see us are able to talk in long form, you see Hakeem do this. We're able to share that. And I'm able to share it on, on, on uh, debates that we have and other things that are a little bit longer time frame. I think the interesting thing is, though, is in a lot of the times that you see us, unfortunately, is either on a TV interview at one of the major networks in which we're there for a specific topic, for a specific purpose that is political in nature. It, 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 it's almost like asking, you know, uh, the you know one of the players last night for the Chiefs or for the 49ers to talk about a, you know something other than the game that they're in at that moment or to talk different about their their strategy for that game in a longer form you'll find out that they're actually the teammates you know from different teams go out and do stuff together but at the end of the day politi politics you can never divorce the politics from this and unfortunately the way our especially broad short form interviews are there for a specific purpose for a specific time. That's why I prefer a lot of times to come into places like this. Uh, I encourage a lot of my members to do this that I work with, but unfortunately we got members on both sides that won't do this. And it's just a, it's just a tough time. Okay. Yep. All right, we have uh, time for one or two more uh, short questions. I don't think yeah. Thank you for coming out here. Thank I really you. respect uh, you engaging us in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you made a comment earlier about you do believe that climate change is uh, caused by human. Um, it's a factor, yes. Right. Do you believe that uh, climate change is an existential crisis facing our country and the world? And are you willing to, uh, if you do agree, say that on a media platform? No, I don't. Because, the, and, and I'll tell you the reason, I'll, the language used is not the, I don't think it's the appropriate language for where we're at. Do we need to make changes? Are we moving changes from there from where we were? Yes, but to, you know, and I, I don't wanna, and I, hear my question, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a lot of your questions. I wanna be, you understand. I remember in the 1970s growing up that there, you know, that the same, these arguments were completely reversed. There was a hole, you know, the, the hole in the ozone, we're gonna have an ice age by the time we're, you know, 2020, you know, time frame. You know, it's just, it just changes over time. Is it a threat? Yes. We can disagree about this, but how do we go about it? Is it only America? If America has zero carbon emissions from, from tomorrow, we don't change, we barely touch the needle worldwide. We barely touch the needle worldwide. So we could take it all on our own, but then we also regress in, in our leadership role in, in the world. So I, I just disagree with the terminology. I don't disagree that it's not something we should look at and we should be a part of, but also I'm not gonna put it in the terminology of it being the top, you know, Existential. I just take offense at the existential part of it. Would you be willing to say it in another? And I apologize for asking another question. Uh, would you be willing to say it then that this is a major or a top priority? I think it's not, a threat. I'm, I think it's a threat, just like every other thing we, uh, in our country. I'm not. It's not something. From my perspective, from the stuff that I'm working with, this is a part of a legislative agenda that we need to talk about. But when you get to talking about, you know, dealing how we deal with our economy, you deal with criminal justice reform, you deal with the internet, you deal with the privacy, you deal with the other thing. It's part of the whole. Um, I don't need a mic. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> I can do that as well. Um, I'm a conservative. Um, I actually interned for Senator Flake uh, oh. seven years ago. Now it's been a while. He's no longer in the Senate. Right. And that kind of cuts to my question. Um, when Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan ran for president, I think one of the major planks of the Republican platform 
was reigning in spending, executive overreach. Yeah, and one of my biggest critiques of President Trump is that he didn't run on that, and I don't expect him to govern on that. Are you comfortable with the direction in that respect of where the Republican Party is going? And what does the GOP look like when Trump is gone, whether that's in 2020 that's or 2024? Great question. I think one, I think it's twofold. Okay, I think what the president has brought forth was a shaking up of a lot of issues that had been, from our side, had just sort of ground to a halt a little bit. What most people don't realize in dealing with this president, and, and you just have to take my word for it, this president, if given an opportunity, and I say this not jokingly, but honestly, to have Democrats who had came forward and put ideas that normal, normally Republican orthodoxy wouldn't have taken, he would have took. And we look at it in, um, you know, in it, in, in, I know it's gotten muddled a great deal with immigration, but also with transportation spending, with other things like that. Some of the concerns that I have is that where we are, and, and it is true, that the president's main focus has not been on the debt and the deficit issues that, you know, traditional Republicans always parrot. Um, but what it has been, it's been interesting, is in trade and negotiations like that, whether we agree with the philosophy of how to get there, we have seen movement on that that we hadn't seen before. So the question coming back now is, is with our economy doing well, will we begin to take on those issues that drive those issues that many of us feel are threats, you know, as we look forward uh, in, in our economy and also into our, our security as we move forward. Where we move forward from here, it's interesting because I see, I'm gonna speak globally, I'm gonna pull out of Republican for a second and talk, speak as a political scientist or looking at it from that perspective. The more information we have has made us more populist. And I, and I don't say that as a fact, I just say it as a general, I don't know, I don't know another way to describe it, okay? Um, I'm from Northeast Georgia. Anybody ever heard of Zell Miller? Remember Zell? Zell was a constituent of mine. You know, Zell was a Democrat till the day he died. But he's a different, you know, from a, from a perspective of sort of, he would not, as he even said earlier on, he wasn't welcome in the party that, uh, had it, how it changed. Just like, unfortunately, many times Senator Flake was not as welcome in the Republican Party as, as he would have been at another time. Um, I think that's the changing. What I am concerned about a little bit is that both parties can't find central topics to agree upon and then have everybody you know, be a part of that. Um, I don't know if there's any political science major or professors, you know, for going, you can go back to your background here. Uh, here's, the, here's the question for the next 20 years. Will we still be a two-party country in 20 years? I'm not sure we will be, and it's going to come from both sides. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, Ms. Astacio Cortez, uh, who has done a great job of energizing uh, a, a progressive base, has said that in a different country she wouldn't be in the same party as Joe Biden. I've got people on my side who say I can't be in the same party as Mitt Romney. So the interesting question is, and, and this is a theoretical question, maybe this is the best place to sort of end this because hopefully you'll think about it because it's not an easy answer. If you've got an easy answer for this one, Go form your own school because you'll make a million dollars. How do you take a multi-party system and apply it to Congress? We're not designed for a multi-party system, but yet we are heading that way to a coalition-style government that is really going to be the next question. Um, the governor here, we disagree on, there's several things that we would disagree on, but I consider her a Republican, and I hope she consider me a Republican. We can get common things done. But when we begin to be separate and distinct, then how do you get chairman? How do you get a speaker? Because we're not a parliamentary system. But yet, unfortunately, we're acting like a parliamentary system in many ways. So I appreciate it. Thanks for the question. Great. Well, and I appreciate all of you um, and how smoothly this entire event has Yes. Gone. Thank you. Thank you.